we get that first picture up? There it is. <coughs> I'll admit, it was a bit of an old man car. Uh, but this is my first car. Uh, it was a 1989 Mazda 929. If anyone knows the Mazda 929 model, that car is way ahead of its time. This thing was now 30 years old, but I still s there's still things in this car that are much more advanced than what I'm driving currently right now. This thing, not only did it look good on the outside, had a nice paint job, nice rims. Um, you, you open up the door and it's like, you got leather seats. Uh, in, the, in the winter time in Canada, it's good to have heated seats. So you press a little button and your seat would heat up, kind of just nicely warming your back and your backside a little bit. Uh, on the mirrors, you press a little button and it would kind of heat up the mirrors a little bit to melt any ice. This thing was, was really great. I got an amazing deal on it. Amazing. I couldn't believe the deal I got on this car. Uh, I thought, wow, I got a steal of a deal. And so um, we, I bought it in the spring and uh, drove it through the spring and summer and fall, and it got to the winter time. And then I realized why I got such a good deal. So in the winter time, this thing was dangerous. Um, <laughs> you, you'd go in, in Canada, there's a lot of ice on the road, and so whenever, for some reason, in the winter time, the engine liked to rev really, really, really high. Like the RPMs would go, would just, would go really high, which is really dangerous on ice. So you, you'd come to a stop or slow down, and then this thing just wants to keep going. It's revving up higher, and you, you're, you're slamming the brake on, and you're just holding it back because as soon as you let that brake go, it's like a bunch of horses just going. It's, it's gone. And so it's, it's kind of dangerous in wintertime. So um, we somehow survived uh, our first winter with this vehicle. I think we actually did two winters with this vehicle until finally we're like, enough. We got to get rid of this thing. It's way too dangerous. But this thing had some real, real problems on the inside. I didn't know it. That's why I got such a good deal on it. Um, but on the outside, it looked amazing. And as a young 20-something, when I bought it, it was a few years old already, man, I was looking on the outside, I was like, this thing is beautiful. But sometimes we do that. Sometimes we focus on the outside of things before, and it looks good to everybody. But we need, what's really needed is the change on the inside. And uh, today we're looking at Colossians 2. Last week we started our series on Colossians. Uh, Sheshi talked in Colossians 1. And in this book, Paul is writing, and he's kind of been on the defensive here. He's, he's been sounding the alarm on the lies, the scams, the deceits of the false teachers at the church in Colossae. He's been saying that Jesus is sufficient. All we need is Jesus. We don't need anything else. We don't need these man-made things that are made up to get us, help us get closer to God. In him, according to verse 3, um, we have wisdom and knowledge. We are complete in him, verse 10. And over and over and over again, the Apostle Paul is coming back saying, there's no need to go after something that you already have, and that's in Jesus. And I was, look, I was looking at what we have in Jesus, what we have in Christ already, and I'm, I think Sheshi touched on some of these before uh, last week, but just read a few of these off. I'm free from the law of sin and death in Romans. I have the mind of Christ in Corinthians and Philippians. I have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. I've received the power of the Holy Spirit, and he can do miraculous things through me. I have authority and power over the enemy in this world. I'm born again. I'm spiritually transformed, renewed, set apart for God's purpose through the living and everlasting word of God. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm not ruled by fear because the Holy Spirit lives in me and gives me his power, love, and self-control. I could go on and on and on of what we have in Christ, and that is all we need. What we have in Christ is what we need. But we're going to look at the, the last few verses in Colossians 2, uh, verses 16 to 23. <clears throat> and we're looking at 
a few approaches that people use to intimidate maybe your walk with Christ. So the false teachers who are in, um, were in the day of when Paul is at, at this church, they were like bullies in the church. They had shrunk Jesus into kind of this small little box, kind of insignificant, insufficient for them, because uh, we, needed, we needed Jesus and something else. We need Jesus in this, we need Jesus in this, Jesus in this. And so we're going to get into a little bit more detail of what they were saying and how that can apply and how we see that today. So Paul's writing to this new church plant. And for those of us who are parents out here, uh, at first, you know, we tell our kids, you know, don't do this, don't do that, because they don't know enough already. And so uh, as they get older, hopefully we do less of that and show them how to make decisions on their own. Um, Because they need to learn how to think, because we can't always be there for them for all these major decisions. So a child needs to go from doing what they're told to determining what they should do. And this is similar with the church plant here that that Paul is writing to. He can't be there with them all the time to walk them through all along the way. He's in prison, but he's even kind of like a dad to them. And he can't be there with them saying, you know, don't believe what these guys are teaching, don't believe this, believe this. So he's teaching them that there are some counterfeits, counterfeits to Christianity, and that's what he's writing here in Colossians. So we'll we'll look at Colossians 2, 16 and 17 um, first, and then we'll go all the way down to 23, but we'll just do these first two verses first. It says, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. And I was thinking, why do we need, why do believers of Christ insist on making some man-made rules and regulation and then imposing them upon others? And I think that the flesh, in some ways, just loves legalism. We love to follow rules, because it's easier. It's easier to do that than it is to have maybe a personal relationship. So they have these regulations about food, disciplines, religious observances, what they can drink. And their regulations make many feel spiritual. So I was looking at some rules and laws, and I'd like to look at some of these old laws that some of them are still intact today, uh, some of them are not but some of these laws that are made hundreds of years ago, and the states, the U.S. always has some good examples of these. But in, uh, I'll, I'll just read a few of them here. In a, in a place in Kentucky, tickling a woman under her chin with a feather duster while she's in church service carries a penalty of $10 and one day in jail. Another one, in Oregon, no one can eat unshelled roasted peanuts while attending church in this town. No citizen in a state of Ar- in the state of Ar- Arkansas is allowed to attend any church in attend church in any red colored garment. So I'm out. So Shashi, you can come to this. <laughs> Turtle races are not permitted within a hundred meters of a local church at any time in a small town in, in Louisiana. Now these are kind of humorous when you first look at them, but until the fact that all those had to do something with church. And at some point, and the sad thing is that there were probably some arguments along the way with people in the church to get these things into law, which is kind of crazy because at some point there were turtle races in and around the church. And we're like, what, what, why, why are we doing these things? Why are we having these, these weird laws that... You know, so it's, it's humorous to look at that. So the question is, why do people who call themselves Christians get tied down in some of these rules and regulations? Paul's been saying throughout this chapter and through chapter one that all we need is Christ. So he starts with the word therefore in our verses here. He says, do not let anyone judge you. Or in other words, don't let someone appoint themselves as judge of your spiritual life. Don't let anyone make a spiritual judgment on you based on what you do or don't do. And the false teachers, according to verse 16, were judging them based on 
the Jewish ceremonial laws. So these people went around pointing fingers, bullying Christians at the Colossae. They would say, why are you drinking this? Why are you eating this? That's forbidden in the Old Testament. Now in the Old Testament, God has laws about people's diet. He didn't set them up to, def you know, to deprive them of these things, but he wanted his people to be set apart and different. But in the New Testament, these laws were abolished. And Jesus says in Mark 7, um, that it's not what gets, goes into a man that defiles him, or in other words, what he eats, but what comes out of his heart. Well, these bullies walked around judging people because of their diet, or in some cases, their festivals and their days that they observe as well. Different groups have different holidays, holy days. Some don't celebrate their birthday because it's not holy to celebrate your birthday. How many of us celebrate Christmas? Probably many of us do. Certain people don't celebrate Christmas as a protest. What about Halloween? Halloween's a big one. Maybe not so much here in Tanzania, but in North America, it's, it's a big one. It's a big divisive uh, holiday in some ways because some won't want to celebrate due to where the origins of where it came from. And this is kind of how maybe legalism starts. It starts with someone maybe who struggled with something. Maybe it's drinking alcohol. Maybe it's messing up and watching something online that gets you into trouble. So what you do is you make a rule for yourself to help yourself. I'm not going to go to places that serve alcohol because I know for me it gets me into trouble. That's great. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's cool. Or I'm going to get rid of the internet in my house because I know what happens when I'm alone and it gets me into trouble. No problem. Those are guardrails for your life. Those are good because you know what happens when they're not in place. But what happens when I have these convictions in my life and I demand that others follow the same rules for them? When I start judging people because they're not following my own convictions, when they're not following the same rules for me, that's kind of how legalism starts. Because legalism is rooted in fear. Unfortunately, these legalistic bullies are not, have not disappeared in our day. There are people who are judging others' spirituality based on what they do externally, how they eat, what they eat, how they drink, what they drink, and it goes on. There's certain exter external standards that they feel every Christian should be abiding by. And in our day, I think some of the bullies come in the form of alcohol. The Bible is pretty clear that we're not to get drunk in Ephesians. Okay, that's, that's pretty... That's, that's great. But there are some who would say, um, a fellow church member, if they were to see them drinking a, a glass of wine and say, you know what, that person's not a Christian because I saw them drinking wine. And I get it. That's how I grew up. I grew up in a home where my parents didn't touch a drop of alcohol. And I grew up thinking, man, this is wrong stuff. You do not touch the stuff. Because somewhere in the Bible, I know, somewhere in the Bible says, do not even touch alcohol. I didn't find it for myself, but I thought it's got to be in there somewhere. And that was the example set for me. So at one point, a person that I respected and was an influence on my life, and someone who I was, was an elder in the church, and I, I, I went to their house at one point, and I saw in their garage some leftover cans of beer. Um, now, it wasn't any type of beer. It was 0.5% beer. That's like one step away from, like, water. It was 0.5 beer, and I, I saw it. Now, growing up in my, in my background, I was like, oh, my goodness. Everything that I've heard this guy say through all these years is now in question because... He drinks 0.5% alcohol from time to time. Man, I'm, I was questioning his faith. I was questioning where he stood. Totally wrong. Totally wrong. I was judging his relationship with Christ because he liked to have a beer from time to time. But if we think about how many non-Christians are out there who have also made a similar, like a vow of abstinence from alcohol, we can't measure someone's spirituality by their externals. I remember uh, in Bible college, 
and uh, there was a worship night, and I was sitting near the back. And when you sit near the back, um, well, we were just sitting at the back. Anyways, uh, and it had been going on for a while, and so I was worshiping along. I was sitting with some of my friends, and I decided to sit down. A couple of them also decided to sit down as well. We're still worshiping. The worship leader from the front of the, who was leading worship, in between songs, pointed us out, said, you guys at the back, you're not even worshiping, stand up. Because worship was about standing up, I guess at that point. And I felt so singled out, I'm like, you have no idea what I'm doing or what I'm not doing. And we can't be judging by those externals. Paul, near the end of those verses, talks about a shadow. And he's, he's bringing these rules and regulations to a lot, like they're, like, they're like shadows. They're like shadows. And when we know Jesus, and we're walking with Jesus, he's the real thing. These other things are just shadows. We don't have hanging on our walls shadows of the people that we love. We have the real thing. And those are great until we actually have the real people in our lives. So the shadows, these, these shadows are these rules, these regulations that people put in place to try to get closer to God when all we need is Jesus himself. If we look down to verses 18 and 19, it says, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they've seen. They're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God, continue, as, grows as God causes it to grow. So secondly, he's saying, let no one disqualify you. The, the word disqualify means kind of act as an umpire. And if you think of umpire, think of baseball. Um, the umpire in the game, throwing people out, calling strikes. In other words, don't let anyone throw you out of the game for allegedly having broken rules that God has never imposed. So this bully kind of wears an umpire, an umpire outfit. He steps up and says, you know what, you're out of the game. Because if you don't have experiences like I do, then you're out. And that's kind of this thing called mysticism. It's seeking spiritual reality apart from truth. And the truth is is Jesus. It's based more on feelings, intuition. It's seeking deeper and higher and personal religious experience apart from the truth of God's word. Now Paul's not saying people cannot have visions or have God speak to them in dreams or have amazing encounters with, with God. He's not saying that. However, I do think he is saying that those who do have them and insist that others have the same experience and if they don't, they're second-class Christians or less spiritual than they are. That's not true. Those people can be spiritual bullies. They're like umpires in the game, kicking them out of the game when they have no right to do so. Paul kind of lists in detail some of these characteristics. If we think that, you know, God is up here and we're down here, how can we get access to God? And it mentions angels as well. How can we touch God and get a hold of him? You know, we're so lowly, so let us get through to him, maybe possibly through an angel is what they're saying. Some of them are maybe they're getting visions of, of Michael or Gabriel coming to them, and they start getting obsessed with that. So much to the point where everyone else is feeling a little less of a believer and loser spiritually. The text says, they delight in false humility. They delight in false humility. When you start boasting about your humility... It's not humility anymore. It's pride. And humility is one of those things that when you think you have it, it's actually gone. When you start saying, I'm so sinful and I should not talk to God because of that, and look at me, I'm so lowly, Paul says they're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. In other words, they're not humble, they're proud. And in the flesh, they're not in the spirit. But why are they, pri why are they proud? Why is it pride? If you look at verse 19... They're denying God's provision for them to come to him. Jesus Christ 
is that. Anytime we're denying Jesus Christ as a way to get closer, uh, closer to God, we're kind of in deep trouble. And Paul uses this, con- this common metaphor of a body disconnected from its head to illustrate some of these effects of trusting in your own experiences. You know, once it becomes all about the experiences, Jesus becomes secondary, and in a sense, you're severed and disconnected from the source of life. Growth is stunted. You need to stay close to the head, which is life, which is Jesus. And there's this belief amongst um, New Age circles that you're climbing this ladder to get to higher spiritualities or a higher level of spirituality. And you'll hear quotes of how as we're climbing this le- higher levels of consciousness, it's, but it's, it's a ladder concept. And if we think about ladders in the Bible, there's a ladder in Genesis 28 that has to do with a guy named Jacob. And if you know the story, um, does the ladder come from ground upwards to heaven or is it the opposite? Anyone know? Is it coming from earth to heaven or is it coming from heaven down to earth? It's coming from heaven to earth. So if you're thinking of, it's, it's all foreshadowing what, that Jesus is going to be coming down to us. Because Jesus is bringing the supernatural with him. He's bringing healings. He's bringing miracles. It's all connected to him. And if it doesn't connect in any way to Jesus, then it's counterfeit. It's fake. It's demonic. If these experiences that we're seeking are not connected to Jesus, whatever they may be, Some of you here have been chasing those, have chased those, maybe you still are. Chasing spiritual experiences that are apart from Jesus. I think we can see this in Tanzania as well. We see a lot of, um, I'll be careful here, but we do see a lot of people announcing themselves as, as one who can really connect with God. I am the mouthpiece for God. Um, this is a, this is a similar, thing, similar thing. We can get into trouble following, doing this, but also following people as well. Because the devil is an expert at counterfeits. He's seeking to, seeking to be spiritual without having it connect in any way to Jesus. Man, he's fine with that. If there's no way it, it can connect with Jesus, fine. And I don't think we should be chasing these signs, these wonders... But we should be walking around being connected with Jesus. And when that happens, the signs, the wonders will be following us. People will get healed. God will speak. Supernatural things will happen. But it won't be counterfeit. It won't be fake because we're walking with Jesus. Those things will follow us, but it's not something that we should be following. Let's go down to verse 20 to 23. It says, Since you died with Christ to the elemental forces of this world why as though you still belong to the world do you submit to its rules do not handle do not taste do not touch these rules which do have which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. And if you think of some of the passions of our physical body, like food and comfort and all these things, we can get into trouble with our physical body. And this leads some people to think that, well, the body's evil. You know, this this idea of um, false humility, harsh treatment of the body, This has been around for for centuries in the church. Various church leaders, monks, uh, beating themselves up to get closer to God. You have ones that are never changing clothes to get closer to God. Washing their feet, sitting on tops of poles for decades in the elements so that people would look at them and say, wow, they must be so spiritual because they are doing this or they are doing that. Some would castrate themselves to avoid lusting or walking miles on their ease, on their knees. Why? Just to f- try and gain favor with God. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. 
because all we need is Jesus and not these things to help us try and get closer to God. Sometimes we can pride ourselves on the different sacrifices that we are making. I can say this because I thought this when I first got here, um, but I've heard it numerous times as well. If you really love God, then you're not going to sleep in a comfortable bed. Live in a nice home. Run your AC only on Christmas. Only on Christmas. The rest of the year, you leave it off. Um, <laughs> I run my AC a lot now <laughs> because it's comfortable. But what is happening is that I'm, I'm trying to mature my soul as much as I can through some type of suffering. The only way that God matures me is through hardship and suffering. Well, no, God matures me through all circumstances. When I'm healthy, when I'm sick, when things are going great, when things are not going great, there's always stuff to learn. He's using all these circumstances to grow and mature me, but the problem with some of this minimalist thinking is that it's only through pain and suffering that we can learn and grow. So if God calls you to poverty, praise God. If he calls you with riches, praise God. If he calls you to be a pastor, amazing. However, that's not the basis of our spirituality. It's not Christianity and... Um, it's not, it's not Christ and, and poverty. It's not Christ and never taking a bath. It's not Christ and living in a monastery. Or Christ anything. It's Christ and Christ alone. So we have some good news. Because Jesus has come for us in a body that he lived his life full obedience to the law. With relationship with Jesus and the presence of power of the Holy Spirit, we can decide what we are supposed to do with the body and its passions and its pleasures. But we need to understand, we need to believe, and we need to live by the principle that God loves us perfectly. Nothing more is required on our part, and that's the point of grace. We'll never deserve grace, but God gives it anyways. There's nothing more that we need to add. God cannot love you more than he already loves you. When you operate out of a sense of obligation, it becomes a chore. When you operate of a sense of delight in serving God, it becomes an offering of worship. And that's what your life is to be. That's the good news. So, but we need to guard our freedom. We shouldn't let anyone act as a judge or an umpire on our life because we are complete with Christ. And we don't need these other things to help get us closer with Christ. We don't need to be following these man-made rules to be set up and, and you know, it's something that we've been doing for years. And, and why do we do it? I don't know. We just do it. Are there things in your life that you're just, you're just doing because you don't know why you're doing them? For yourself, which one of these do you maybe more uh, lean towards? Is it, is it following certain rules and regulations to make you think that you're getting closer to God? Is it seeking your own spiritual experiences rather than focusing on the Jesus as, the, as part of that? Is it false humility? Is it denying yourself pleasure so that you can get, attempt to get closer to God? Which one of these is it for you? Maybe it's all three. Maybe it's none of them. That's amazing. But there's things that look good on the outside, but sometimes there's nothing on the inside. If you're not a follower of Christ and you're here this morning, you can do that today. And there's no need to follow these man-made practices that maybe you're doing and you're a, you have no idea why you do these things. We're just doing them. And they promise greater closeness to Christ. Paul is saying and Christ is saying, all you need is Christ. So following Jesus, knowing his word, gives the greatest satisfaction. If you are a believer here this morning, where are you trusting any of these things more than your relationship with Christ? What is making you more secure in your relationship with Christ? Is it your moral church upbringing? Is it serving in Sunday school? Is it giving money? Or where are your weaknesses bigger than Christ? You know, I could never make that commitment because of my past. Or I don't have it all together I, I, just can't, I just can't do it. I was talking with someone a, a while ago, 
and I was talking, we're talking about baptism. And we're like, hey, why don't you get baptized? And they're like, I don't have it all together. I'm not ready yet. But I was like, well, aren't you a believer in Christ? He's like, yep, I am. And I'm like, so what's, what's the problem? I, I just can't do it. I'll do it later on. Um, I'll do it later on when I think I have it all together. And it's not, we're never going to have it all together. We're never going to have that like that. So where are you looking at in your life? Where are you, you know, is it, is it the rules? Is it the experiences? Whatever it may be. Just think about those things. And remind yourself that Paul is saying here in Colossians that it is just Jesus and Jesus alone is what we need. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can come this morning and know that uh, it is you. It is you alone that is able to save. It is you alone that is able to um, do all things, Lord. And it is not other things that are put in the way and to distract us from what is truly uh, the most important things in our life, and that is you. Help us, Lord, to see those things in our own life. Help us to work on those things in our own life. Help us to, um, yeah, just to look to you and to you alone and know that you are enough. We pray these things, Lord, in your name we pray. Amen.